I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my statutory interpretation and regulation class about the US Supreme Court case King v. Burwell. This is actually part one. I'm, this case is complicated and there's a, a two distinct issues. So I'm breaking it into two videos so it won't be too long. This first one really deals with the excerpt that's in my case book that deals with in the court's interpretation of the statute. And um, this case really came to stand for the idea of reading a statute as a whole, looking at the overall structure and trying to make um, the statute fit together. Now, again, for my students, this is one of the, um, it, a in a series of, of litigation about the Affordable Care Act. The it's very complex, the statute and the opinion, because it cross-references in uh, different sections and bounces from one to the other, uses one section to interpret another and so forth. And the court ends up having to acknowledge that the Affordable Care Act has a lot of linguistic problems. It, it's um, poorly drafted and confusing and maybe even contradictory in some places. And ultimately the majority in this divided opinion um, decides to pick the interpretation that saves the statute and saves what's clearly the statutory scheme. And part of what the goal was really in the litigation is this is brought by people who don't like the Affordable Care Act and are attacking a specific part of it that they know without which the whole kind of framework will collapse or stop working. So let's look at what happens in the case. <clears throat> Again, this is a US Supreme Court case from 2015. So the Affordable Care Act requires the creation of an exchange in each state. This is like a marketplace that allows people to compare and purchase insurance plans. And the act gives each state the opportunity to establish its own exchange, insurance exchange. But if it doesn't, by a certain date, then the federal government will establish such an exchange if the state doesn't. Now, the act provides that tax credits will be allowed for any, tax player, ta any taxpayer who has to buy insurance, um, but only if the taxpayer has enrolled in an insurance plan through, quote, an exchange established by the state under the specified section. And that's kind of the sticking point in um, fitting all of these pieces together. So an IRS regulation interprets the language as making tax credits available on an exchange, regardless of whether the exchange is established or op and operated by a state or by the federal agency, Health and Human Services. And so the crux of the case is the interpretation of that phrase in the statute um, that it has, you only get tax credits for an exchange established under the state and the federal government, the agency entrusted with tax um, giving tax breaks and tax and collecting taxes decided that you got the tax credits regardless of whether it was a state exchange or a federal exchange. Now the plaintiffs contended that those who bought insurance on the federal exchanges were actually ineligible for the tax credits because the states in which they resided had not created their own exchanges. And the Affordable Care Act only provided tax credits to citizens who used again, to quote the statute, an exchange established by the state. Now, if you don't get the tax credits, that would make the cost of buying insurance more than 8% more than eight of these petitioners' income, which in turn, under another provision of the statute, would exempt them from the act's coverage requirement. So they wouldn't have to buy insurance at all, they said. And so as a result of the IRS rule, the petitioners would receive the tax credits and therefore would um, have to buy insurance they, because they wouldn't be exempt from the mandate. Just for my students, remember that the first round of litigation about the Obama, uh, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act was over the individual mandate, the requirement that you buy insurance or pay a tax. And so now this is over an exception to that where you don't have to buy it if the insurance is going to be more than 8% of your income. And so the tax credits that you're allowed for insurance though um, are basically an offset to the income. And that really matters for this case. 
So the defendants are several government agencies, and they claimed that the exchanges that have been creating by the federal agency, HHS, qualified as exchanges established by the state. And the court interpreted the phrase to include them, and basically um, adopted the same interpretation, um, thereby making the users of the HHS exchanges eligible to receive the tax credits, which meant that they were not eligible to be exempt from the individual mandate under the Affordable Care Act. So I, for my students, here's your takeaway from a statutory interpretation standpoint. The majority focuses on the overall structure of the statute and which interpretation would make the entire ACA regime collapse basically or not work. And, so, and, it's, and it chooses the interpretation that sort of saves the statutory scheme and framework reasoning that Congress would not have intended the statute to be self-defeating. They wouldn't have built a, like a self-destruct switch into the statute like that. And so we're going to interpret it in a way that Congress basically wanted the statute to fulfill its purpose. In a broader sense, this is similar to the absurdity doctrine, and that's why it's next to the absurdity doctrine cases in my casebook in statutory interpretation. But instead of it producing just a crazy result for this individual, the idea is that we wouldn't have wanted the whole, to, to pick an interpretation that would clearly thwart the will of Congress in enacting the legislation in the first place. So the court now, I, I do want you to notice a couple things about the case. The court here rejects Chevron deference at the outset. And I am going to discuss that in my separate video lecture about it. And that whole section of the opinion is missing from the excerpt in my statutory interpretation casebook, by the way. And it does this under the major questions exception. Um, Another point about the case though that I do want students to know is that the court admits that sections of the statute have inartful um, drafting and then it takes the seeming contradictions as a type of ambiguity for it to resolve. And this is sort of a fascinating like um, approach or maneuver that the majority opinion does is normally we see ambiguity in, or silence in the statute when it, the statute uses a vague word like substantial or reasonable or material or something like that. And here, the court is looking, pointing to this very long convoluted statute and the set, um, different provisions that seem contradictory and saying that the internal contradictions are the ambiguity that the court has to resolve. And it works through several steps in doing this, but the upshot is they're trying to save the statute. They don't want to, they, it's clear that it would thwart the overall purpose of Congress to let the petitioners win in this case because it would sort of undo the um, inner working parts um, and gears of the Affordable Care Act. Um, <clears throat> another interpretive note here about interpreting statutes, the court repeatedly cites its earlier decision in FDA versus Brown and Williamson tobacco for the idea that it should look to the overall purpose and structure the, and the big policy issues at stake to ascertain Congress's intent and then uses that to resolve <clears throat> the question. So it's not just asking how does Congress use this word or what did Congress mean to accomplish by this one little clause in the statute, but what was Congress doing with this legislation? And, and this is a plausible argument, but it's a lot of work, right? To, to um, go through and make an argument for what was the whole point of the statute, what's it trying to accomplish? And then what are the consequences of adopting the different interpretations um, that are available? The court acknowledges that the, pl the plaintiffs here have a plausible argument, a, a, a decent argument, but uh, ultimately they think that what they're asking for would produce a result that would thwart the will of the legislature. Okay, that concludes our first lecture about King V. Burwell.